Hi everyone, welcome to today's masterclass on one hour worth of world building. We're going to start off in Unreal Engine 5 and Houdini and hopefully build out a scene from scratch using one of the tutorial projects done by Unreal. To quickly introduce myself, I'm Tom Stobin, lead technical artist at Rainbow Studios. I previously worked at companies such as Unity and Ubisoft on productions that have been around the scale of 25 feet wide up to 400 kilometers. I've been in the world of procedural for a long time, uh, character tooling, environment tooling, and a lot of my craft so far has been working with an art team and trying to create as much content as possible in as efficient of time as possible. So hopefully you'll get a brief understanding of a couple ways that you can help your team. Hopefully you'll learn Houdini through this talk today and you'll be able to create your own unique world using some of the assets provided by Epic. I hope you enjoy, and let's dive right in. The software used today will be Houdini and Houdini Engine, of course. Open street maps for our initial mapping data and Mapbox to load in the height fields of that data. If you're not familiar with open street maps, it gives you the road networks, it gives you building networks, and Mapbox gives you the height field data of anywhere in the world. You can imagine the two combined with the Mapbox node in Houdini works almost like Google Maps, but for open source data. The core problem we're going to have over the entire course of the talk today, we want to rapid prototype worlds in any art style. The tools today can't be defined by a single art style. They have to be very generalized and you want to be able to use one tool for many purposes. So hopefully we're going to try and instill that mindset in you and hopefully you understand how I approach building a tool and if you can then tailor it after the fact. The same tool set that I'm going to present today was made this scene in about four to five hours with two artists from scratch with nothing to start from. The same scene with the same tools uh, created this with different art uh, and this was about two to three hours. For a personal project on the side, Again, this was about 15 minutes of work. I'm not creating any of the art assets from scratch, but we're talking about the scattering tools and anything else that builds out. And finally, today, this is the world we're all going to create together. It's going to be a desert style world. We're going to scale some foliage. We're going to have some interesting terrains generated and just generally explore how the connection between Unreal and Houdini works and how you can iterate really quickly with those two tools. If you're following along online, the project will not be available locally, of course, but you can just grab the same assets that I'm using today in the talk from the Epic Store, and it will be the Old West Learning Pack. It's free to download, uh, and we'll have all of the assets used today. It has the landscape materials and anything else you might need for this project to be done. Let's dive in. The first step in our journey today, we're going to install Houdini Engine into Unreal. There's a couple different ways you can do this, but this is how I do it. So it's installed on every project. You go to your folder location where you have installed Houdini. If you're using the launcher, it will install it in a separate folder. For example, mine will be Houdini engine. During the download and installation of Houdini, I've selected Unreal as a version. We simply dive into that folder, go to your specific Houdini version. Doesn't have to be the exact one seen on screen. We're going to be using Unreal 5.1. So you dive into that folder and you can just select this folder and copy it. Now we're going to navigate to where you have installed Epic Games Unreal Engine 5.1. I'm going to dive into that folder. We're next going to go into Engine then plugins, and you're going to be able to just copy that Houdini engine straight into here. Just as I've done, you'll see it matches in this exact file path seen in the top of the screen here. Let's keep going. Okay, so I've opened up the Northwood scene that came from the project demo that we downloaded previously. It's going to look slightly different to you. I've accidentally broken it in the process of making this tutorial, but it's not going to make much difference for you. To check if Houdini Engine is properly installed at this point, if you have it at the top left of your screen as a window bar, you're perfect. If not, it may just be in your plugins. We're going to search Houdini 
and just make sure it's enabled. It will have your version number of the specific version you installed. This needs to match the version you're running within Houdini. Once that's working, you can create a session. Otherwise, once you create your first HDA or tool, it will automatically initialize the session for you. The first thing I did was take the Northwood scene. I just made a copy of it and I deleted almost everything from the project. Any of the meshes, I kept a single building, but any of the meshes, any of the landscape we deleted. The only thing I have kept is the scene setup folder. It has a lighting folder, which is exponential height fog, a skylight and a sky sphere. I've brought the directional light into it, our post process volume and our sky atmosphere with volumetric cloud. So that's just the basis for our lighting. It's exactly what they have in the default scene. I've kept the sphere reflection capture and there's nothing else really to the scene. I've also brought over the runtime virtual texture. You don't need to, it's not the exact same naming anymore. So we're going to create this from scratch. You don't need to copy that over. And I've kept their wind directional source, though I don't believe we use this in the end. Let's start the Houdini side now. I'm going to start relatively slow and we're going to ramp up pretty quickly so we can actually complete this tutorial within the allotted amount of time. If I'm pausing, I'm sorry, I'm not a master. I do have notes on the other screen. And so I'm just going to be swapping back and forth just to make sure this is a smooth experience for all of us here. Let's go. So in the bottom of Houdini, we're going to have a objects section. If I type a geometry, Imagine these as parent objects to whatever you're working with. A single object or a group of objects can be contained within this collection. When you double clicked, you go inside of an object. The file structure or pathing of this is seen at the top. You can go back and forth simply by clicking or you can press the U key to go up and down. When you press tab or right click, it's going to have all of the nodes that are accessible within the scene. If I do star, you can see there's a ton of them. We're only going to cover a bunch today. So hopefully you can kind of grasp where we go with these and slowly you'll learn more and more nodes as you learn Houdini. We're going to put down a height field. So I did HF. Again, the tab is pretty efficient. You can do the first letter of the first word and move on to the second word. Uh, first letter and it will catch what you're trying to type. The screen on the left is our viewport. I'm going to do space F to frame it within the world in the scene. And then again, click to drag, right click is zoom in and out and middle click to pan around the scene. A height field is a terrain system. And so it is basically a top down 2D representation in the end, uh, but we're going to visualize it in 3D. And the game engine is going to read it and display it in 3D. So the first thing you need to know in Unreal specifically, there are very specific sizes uh, that landscapes need to be set at. This is purely for optimization. You can find the exact sizes of different terrains on the Houdini engine Unreal uh, documentation page. I will link that hopefully uh, on the edit. However, for today, we're going to set this to 2017 by 2017. And that's a specific size that Unreal provides. I'm going to set my grid spacing to one. So that's going to increase my resolution within this. And the next thing I'm going to display the polygon count, or in this case, the voxel count in the bottom right. To do that, we're going to have our cursor over the viewport. I'm going to hit D. I'm going to go to guides, and we're going to go to geometry information and set this to always on. I'm going to save this as default just so it's always on my screen. For that, this could be your first tool. You could encapsulate this and this be the entire purpose of the tool, just creating a single height field. But of course, that'd be useless. So let's create some type of noise, some type of shape. If you type noise, you're going to see there's a bunch of different types of noises. The specific one we want is height field noise. If you pressed enter twice, you're going to accidentally go into the HDA and you're not going to see anything or HDA in this case refers to Houdini digital asset. It is a tool, a collection of nodes. 
We don't want to edit what's inside of it. So we're going to press U again to go up, or you can just use the file path up here. So if you ever make a mistake, just go back up. Don't be afraid to spam escape. There's no wrong clicks in Houdini. We're going to connect the dots again. This is a nodal system. So we connect the top to the next and we're going to create some type of noise. The first thing I'm going to do is remove the grid just gets in the way for me. And we can click and rotate around our scene. It's just going to be some type of random amount of noise. You can tweak the parameters in the top by clicking on the slider. You can middle click on the number and go left to right. And that's going to be big gradual movements. If you go up or down on the slider, it depends on how much you increment it by. For now, I'm just going to keep it pretty default. Uh, if you want to reset a node, by the way, you can do control middle click. I believe there's also a right click on it and there is revert to previous value or there should be a delete. I don't remember what it is, so use control middle click. We'll move on. I'm going to reduce the size just to get some type of interest in mountains in the distance. Right, we have some type of interesting silhouette here. The first thing I'm going to do is I know by the end of this process, I'm going to want to place some type of foliage, maybe some houses. Uh, and so we're going to need some flat ground. So for this, we're going to use a height field flatten. Now you're going to see it's not flattening anything in the current case. We can increase that mask blur radius. Again, it's doing nothing. If you set it to flatten to value, still doing nothing. You did flatten to average height doing nothing. That's because it is using a mask or requiring a mask in this case. So we need some type of mask to power this node. So we're going to do mask by feature. And I typed the wrong one. We need a height field mask by feature. We're going to drag that node in. It's going to connect it into the line. And you're going to notice the height field flatten is already calculating. So wherever you put your eyeball, if you hover over, you can see the eyeball right here or it is the rightmost dot, you can click it and we can edit our mask. So the mask is red where we're going to apply this and the white is where we're not applying this effect. I'm going to set a relatively tame angle here. So grabbing mostly what's already flat, around 15 degrees, we'll see if that's good enough. And I'm going to increase my smooth radius. And that's going to blur out that masking and bring out more of those shapes that I want to flatten down. Now, when I go to the height field flatten, we can set our mask blur radius to something like 20. Let it compute. There we go. It took about 30 seconds. And now we flattened out big chunks of the terrain. If you're having trouble seeing it, we're going to do a height field mask clear node, and that's going to remove our mask. You can see we've flattened out big chunks of the environment. Anywhere that was practically red is now flattened, uh, averaged out to the area around it. And this is just going to create that interesting areas that one are flat and you can place a lot more objects in. You don't want too much noise on average, uh, but we want just enough. Uh, that there's space and some visual interest within these, almost like planes within a world. Uh, these are where your cities could be placed, wherever bigger, larger objects would go. The next thing we're going to want to do is add some type of distortion, a little bit of noise, a little of visual interest to the scene. So I'm going to drop down a height field, distort by noise. Connecting this straight in. Already, we're getting some of the very first kind of perception of mountains. We're getting a little more realism without actually doing full erosion at this stage. I'm going to increase my amplitude. It's a little too strong. Let's say around 32. I'm going to set my element size to go a little larger. Again, this is all by eye all up to your own interpretation of how you want to do this. If we look down 
top down, we can see what this node is doing. It's swirling it in the world. So we're just adding a little bit of ripple with these mountains, pushing them around so it's less uniform noise. Starting to get some type of visual interest in these. I think the next thing I want to add is some type of terracing. So I'm going to add some stepping within the mountains, a little bit of, again, space that I can place crops or foliage or some type of prop in this case. Not sure what yet. So we're going to do a height field mask by feature again. I'm going to mask out anywhere that's fairly steep. So we're going to drop that max slope angle all the way up to 90. And I'm going to bring up the end of this slider. You can see what it's doing and it's grabbing the middle section where it's a little flat and fully masking it out so it's always masked. And I think I'm happy with 20 degrees. So that's just grabbing the steeper sections of pretty much every mountain here. I'm going to do a height field terrace. So the height field terrace node adds really strong stepping. Uh, again, this is great for if you're doing something like a rice biome or you're going to have lots of human cut out things. However, we can simulate just a very subtle effect. In this case, I hit compute range just to set the entire terrain as the tear size. However, you can notice it's not using our mask. That's because if you see, it has two inputs this time. If you hover over, you can see it says mask is the second input. I'm going to connect that in. However, I don't necessarily need to see the mask, so I'm going to connect the terrain to the height field distort node. And that's just going to keep it within a self-contained system. And I believe it actually is copying over the mask, but that doesn't matter right now. So we can see it is way too strong of an effect. So we're going to dial this down. We're going to add a bunch of fade. So that's going to fade the edges. You can see right here. Might be even too strong. I'm going to decrease the stepping size. Have a lot more steps within these mountains. Say about six, maybe. I'm going to smooth out the edge. Whoa, that's way too much. Maybe around two. And again, you want to play with these numbers. It really will change according to the scale and size of your terrain. I'm looking over here. Uh, let's see if my cursor will show. There we go. And you want to see how the light hits off of these. So you can see it's adding a little bit of flatness. I mean, we could decrease the fade. It's not doing too much of an effect if we pulse it back and forth. And that's because our smoothing is pretty strong. There we go. I might increase the stepping size a little bit. And I'm going to increase that fade. So it's almost going to appear like chunks of rock have kind of fallen out of that section, dropped onto the edge. We're getting a bit of the pulsing along the landscape. The next thing we can do is add some undulations. So that's going to take these straight lines and again, wobble them like a sine wave almost. So we can add, I don't think we need to set a type. I guess we might have to. I'm going to decrease the size. Undulation. And again, it's quite hard to see what we're looking at here, so I'm going to do a height field mask clear. And you can see what we're actually adding here. So this is for me, the stage is just about pulling ups and downs the entire mesh so those it's not so linear along our mountains. We don't want to affect too much our silhouette here. But you can see how much of an effect that has uh, when we're viewing in grayscale with the lighting. 
looks good to me. And I might add a little stronger of purling noise this time. So I'm gonna do a height field to store my noise again. View that. And we're gonna set this to pretty high amplitude. Let's see what 150 looks like. Because if I increase the element size, again, those two scale together. So let's view what that looks like before and after. So for me, what I'm trying to do is break up those organic or inorganic in this case. You can see it kind of looks like big chunks, collective shape. If I draw along that. For me, my brain's kind of picking out reoccurring patterns. I mean, there really isn't when we're looking at this terrain here. But I want each mountainside to kind of feel a little bit more unique than it currently does. So adding that bit of noise. We have a little bit more unique forms, some interesting shapes here. But we're getting a new problem of one, our height field isn't doesn't have enough resolution. And so I'm just gonna approach this by doing a height field blur. You don't want to go too strong because of course you're gonna lose all your detail. Just enough to pull down where it's too sharp. So now that I've kind of established the shape and silhouette of a lot of the mountains I'm wanting to create. I'm going to do a very quick erosion pass uh, with almost the default erode node settings. I'm going to connect that in. And I'm going to preview it. Then we're going to simulate to say frame 10. And just wait for this to complete. Now with that complete, that took about 40 seconds. I'm going to just evaluate if it's Good for the current use. What I'm doing right now is evaluating are the river streams too small, are they too large, have we taken away too much material? For me, this might be usable straight away. I'm going to keep as is. And one of the things that the erode node creates uh, are layers. Now, you can unbind from the layers my range just so it's within the proper height range. But a problem I have, and I'm sure there's a simple solution to this, is if I middle click on the node, you can see it generates a bunch of layers. Now in Unreal, we're going to use those same layers for our auto texturing. And so I need to basically clear away any of these layers. The way I approach this is I use a height field layer node. And we're going to grab our terrain to layer as the erosion and our base terrain will be there. Now, if you middle click, you'll notice we're still bringing across all of those layers. Simply fix that. We just bring across height. We're replacing that star to height at the top right of our layer system. Now, if you middle click, you'll see we're not grabbing anything other than what was already contained. You can see we have a mask mesa and cliff layer from before. Uh, this might be something that we want to delete. I'm going to try and identify where this comes from real quick. It comes from the height field terrace node. In this, I'm going to turn off the mesa layer and cliff layer. I believe there we go. Those layers should be deleted. And we're just going to have to re-simulate erosion real quick. There we go. It's complete. We have a random layer. Up two. I'm just going to find out where that came from. So that appears to be coming from the Heightfield Terrace node as well. I'm not sure why, and I don't have time to investigate that further. So we're just going to push this off to the right. This is where our erosion is going to be passed from. And instead of sourcing from the blur, we can just source our height map because we're taking the original. Uh, all we care about is the scale. So as we go down now, we'll middle click. We only have height and mask layer. That's perfect for the next steps. Last thing that you would want to do is click the reset simulation button. This is just going to pass through all of the data one last time. You see in the bottom left that your frame bar is in orange. That just means it's a cache simulation and it's being refreshed. Just want to click whatever your simulation is, refresh it uh, to get the new version of the data set. So at the next stage of the process, we're ready to auto texture using the 
automatic material that is already set up in the demo project in Unreal Engine. In order to identify what layers exactly that you will use in Houdini, we go to the Northwood folder of the demo project in the landscape section. You can see there is a landscape layer, dirt underscore layer info. The first uh, word in the order of syntax is the exact layer that we'll have to use. So if at any point the documentation or this example page uh, changes, you can just go to this specific folder. Maybe it's in a different location. You can identify which layer names they use, and you can just copy those. However, for today, in the current state, uh, we're going to use dirt, dirt light, dry rocky, dry rocky two. I believe there's only one of these actually used. I can't remember. Grass, grass dead, mountain layer, mud, pebbles, river stone, and rocks. You don't have to use all of them. Uh, I'm going to use, I think, pretty much all of them today, uh, just to show that this process works. But you can mix and match um, and go from there. So this part of the process is kind of painful. Uh, so hopefully we won't take too long on this. And it's only painful because there are so many different layers that are in the auto material. And so you're trying to come up with unique ways to use these textures. And so we're just going to, at the start, do it logically and then try and get through and use all of them. So the first one I'm going to do is a height field mask by feature. Connect that in. And I'm going to mask out just the tops of my mountains. Or actually, let's do the sharp angles first. There we go. So down. So this mask is going to be applied anywhere. Again, that's in red. So we're going to have some type of mountain texture that's applied on each of these faces. From here, we just have to do a high field copy layer. And in the copy layer node, this is where you're going to define uh, what the mask, or in this case, for Unreal, what layer you're going to reference. It has to be the word for word uh, exact layer. So for us, we're using mountain layer. So we're just putting in mountain. That's the only thing you need uh, in the destination. View that. I'm going to go off to the side. And that's just so I should probably name these as well, so I don't repeat. It's so going to be mountain layer. The next we're going to do height field mask by feature again. And this time I'm going to do some mud. So we're going to go a little softer with this one. It'll just be placed at the more flattish areas of all of this mesh. Say around there. We're going to have a bit of a smooth radius applied to this. And I'm going to do a high field mask blur node. Again, this is just to soften it out the edges. So it will blend slightly better into the other textures. And I'm going to go off to the right again, just for organization. Height field, copy layer. This layer will be layer mud. So again, word for word has to be the exact one that you use. For the next one, we're going to do grass. So it is height field, mass my feature. In this case, I'm going to actually do different. Let's add a little variety to this. So we're going to have to identify. So this is the mud layer and we're applying grass. So I want maybe just the edge of all the mud, wherever it's not muddy. And 
a little bit in the mud could actually be okay. And I'm going to soften this out. Again, if it is pixelated here, it will look pixelated in engine. So that's something you have to consider. I feel mask fuller. See quickly, do these have different outcomes? Must be the same. Go with the box blur. No, not exactly the intended result that I'm looking for. There we go. So I'm happy again. This is just where my grass is going to be grown uh, within the scene. I'm going to do a high field copy layer. And I've already made the mistake of not labeling this node. So that's going to be mud layer. This one will be grass. I believe that should be the exact wording on it. If you middle click, you can see we've created our layers are seen right here. Quickly going to save my file. At each stage of this process, you should be saving. Do a height field to mask my feature again. This time, let's do some rocks. I'm going to do the peaks and valleys node. And I'm going to drop this curvature just to get even more aggressive with how we're grabbing those peaks and valleys. I've set the combined with existing to distant, but I'm just going to play with this real quick. See if there's anything interesting. I'm going to multiply that in. So this is multiplying against the uh, grass, which I did not name. So that's going to be something you want to stay on top of, because again, you have seven, eight layers within this. Auto material, so it's going to get a little complicated. So you don't want to forget or use two layers uh, twice because you're going to rewrite over the same data. Just seeing the difference there. This is my rocky and a smooth. So this is just going to do chunks of rock surrounding the grass. It's going to be with the grass, and we'll kind of frame the grass nicely, at least. That's what I'm thinking it's going to do. I'm going to do a high field copy layer. This is going to be dry, rocky layer. The next thing we're going to have is dead grass. So we're working with the desert. So this is going to be on the tops of the mountains, I think. High field, mask by feature. I'm gonna do the flat areas, I'm gonna mask by height this time, click compute range. I'm gonna have it mostly on the higher levels of my terrain here. So it's going to be a smoother blend in. I've increased our height ramp scale in. Again, if you're following along, this can all be by feel. We're just seeing what I feel today. Curious if I bring in curvature into this. This is something that I want. It's a little too spotty. I'm going to leave out curvature on this one. This is going to be a copy layer again. Grass dead layer. Now 
Next layer in the list is pebbles. So we're going to do a height field mask by feature. And as you can see, you start to overlap with a lot of the same masking techniques. So you got to get a little creative with how we do these. This time for the pebbles, I'm going to do it on the lower section of the map. So I'm just imagining if there were rocks, they've fallen down, they're never going to be on the top. Um, at least that's my methodology here. So I've done a smooth radius. I've set a low angle for everything on these pebbles or rocks. I think I'm happy with that for now. I feel to copy layer, I'll drill at this point. Pebbles layer. For the next layer is dirt. So I'm going to do a height field mask by occlusion this time. I think this is a little slow of an operation, but it can give a nice soft result. If it's going to be dirt again, we're in the desert, so dirt's going to be almost everywhere. Do something like a 0.7 minimum. Yeah, I'm liking the look of this so far. So that's going to be a soft top layer along a lot of the terrain. I think I'll keep that as is. Height filled, copy layer. Dirt. And then we're going to have a light dirt. I filled mask and I'm just going to look. I filled mask noise. I wonder if we bring this in with the mask. Let's see what we can. I add any type of interest. Just dialing in a contrast level here. So this is the same mask of our dirt, but just in as few of the areas around it. I'll keep as is to see if that even shows. I'm not sure if it will. I put the copy layer. If at any point you can see I just bypassed that node accidentally, that's the Yellow, that just means you're skipping the node. So we're gonna view it. This is dirt light. It's not mandatory to name uh, your nodes. It's not gonna affect anything. It's just for pure organization. We're almost done with the amount of layers. I believe I just have two left. I'm gonna do a height field as by feature. And this is going to be the final pass of larger rocks. Again, I'm going to have a max curvature. Bring that out to much smoother value. Just seeing what result I'm getting with this here. There we go. So for me, this is going to be the rocks layer. I'm going to have a smooth radius of 9.5 and a peaks and valleys of 0.197. Again, these figures mean nothing, but it's purely eyeball. 
This is going to be a hat failed copy layer, and it's going to be rocks. I think at this stage, we're probably ready to actually use this. The next thing I'm going to do is a Unreal Material node. Viewing that, this is something you could expose in editor. Uh, for me, I know exactly where this is. So this is in the game folder, Northwood Materials Instances. And I'm just going to show you an Unreal where this exact is located. So we go Northwood is the main folder. Materials, Instances, Other. And our material for the landscape will be this MI Landscape 02A. You can right click, copy path, copy file path. So we're going to go back to Houdini, copying that in. You want just the game path. If you've got anything outside of that, you have quotation marks. Don't need any of that, just delete it and just have it starting from the backslash. Game, Northwood Materials, Instances, Other, MI Landscape, O2A, Master Instance, Landscape, O2A. It's a long word to say. Pretty much that's just going to automatically apply the Unreal Material for the landscape uh, and set it all up for you. I'm going to hit Control S just to save my scene. And the next interesting thing, this is very specific to this project again. Um, it uses virtual textures. I can't explain virtual textures uh, fully. All I know is if you have a lot of material um, layers within a landscape, you have to use uh, virtual texturing. It's a Unreal setup to allow Houdini to automatically recognize this. This is a very specific to Unreal uh, setup. I'm going to do attribute create. This is not in the documentation, by the way. This is just something I found on the forums. And we're going to put in Unreal underscore U property underscore draw in virtual textures. So that's going to reference the Unreal U property. And it's just turning on use this into virtual textures. You'll understand what that all means in a second, uh, but you just need it on and it's needs to be a primitive class type and the type is a string. And then again, you're, we're going to write in where is this being saved? So we go back to Unreal, we find exactly where that is. So we go to Northwood folder. There is an RVT folder. I believe it stands for runtime virtual texture. And you'll see there is an RVT material. We're going to copy that file path of the RVT material. And we go back to Houdini. I'm going to control V that in. It looks to be a hard reference where we want soft reference. Let me see if I can get that in a better way. Uh, copy reference. Yeah, it's going to be copy reference. Sorry about that. And for this, you can see it copies in slash script dot engine. We don't need any of that. We need it from runtime virtual texture. So I'm just going to delete the first half. And you can actually leave in the quotation mark here uh, because that is referencing the runtime virtual texture of that path. I'm sorry that was long winded, but let's get this in Unreal and see what it looks like. So in order to get this into Unreal, we just need to make it into an HDA. An HDA is a tool or Houdini digital asset that runs in other software. I mean, it even runs in Houdini, of course. Uh, so I'm going to select everything within my node graph and I'm going to go up to the top left where it says assets. I'm going to do new digital asset from selection. Give that a moment. Probably going to have to resolve your entire graph. Once that's done solving, you're going to get a pop up. This is where you name what your tool is going to be called. We're going to call this EPC01, for example, underscore Ikefield. It's going to save by default to your documents Houdini version number and then in OTLs. 
which is your HDA folder. I'm going to hit accept. And again, it's going to have to save. Once the HD is saved, I don't need any parameters. I don't need anything else to it. We just hit apply and accept and it's closed and done. You'll see if you go up in your layer, you, all those nodes that you had selected will be an EPC 01 HF node. So if we press tab now, it will be in your digital assets and it's going to be one of the nodes that you now have created. If we go to Unreal, I'm in my Northwood empty start scene. Again, this is just the default scene I talked about at the start of this project. I'm going to go to a folder I've created called Houdini Tools. In here, I'm going to go to my OTL folder. So that is in my documents, Houdini folder, OTLs. You can see here, documents, Houdini, OTLs. I have my EPC01 Houdini HDA file. Just drag that into Unreal. With that in Unreal, all you have to do is drag it into your scene. It's going to take a moment to create a Houdini session, and it's going to recook that entire graph within Houdini. When it's finally loaded, it will be brought into the Unreal. You'll see it's flashing. Uh, I'm going to just look up just so I don't give anyone seizures. And we're going to go to, you can see our node in the outliner path. It's in the top right, EPC01 high field. I'm going to click on the landscape just below it and scroll down until I see a section that says virtual texture. You can see we have draw in virtual textures, one array. This is our runtime virtual texture that we connected before. The only thing you have to do is there's a create volumes. Click that create volumes button. Now, when we look down, it will have loaded in all of your materials. You'll see with the automatic materials, uh, they also have props being placed. So that is uh, just props that are assigned to the landscape material. So in dry grassy areas, we're going to be placing our dry grass. We fly over this landscape. You can see at the tops, we have different grass assets. I believe we put little tiny pebbles at the top. And if we fly down to the base, we're going to have pretty thick rocks. There you go. So it looks like all of our auto materials have been set up. Uh, we're probably missing our muddiness. A few of these don't seem to be that strong. You can see them when we look up. But again, this is something you can play with and alter at your own time later on. But everything seems to be working for our auto material. So let's move on to our scatter system and how we scatter larger props uh, within these worlds. Uh, one thing to note while I'm here, actually, we're going to look at this virtual texture. I found uh, that by the default settings in the project, it's quite blurry. And I think that's just to be quite efficient. If you double click on that virtual texture, you'll have some parameters that you can adjust. I've set the size of the virtual texture in tiles to 12. That will make it a 4K. And the size of each virtual texture tile, I've set to zero. I don't know why. I run the forums. This makes it look nice. I'm happy with that looking nice in an hour. And I don't really care about performance of that uh, for today. But that makes sure and ensures that everything is sharp, always in the distance of our virtual texture. Let's move on to our scattering. The scattering side of this part of the tutorial or workshop is going to be very simple. It's just about how we layer this to make it work within the system. If I take the high field, I'm going to do a null node just for my organization. I'm going to say high field in. At the very core of this tool, it's just a high field scatter. If we connect the high field scatter, we hover over. The first put input is terrain. I'm going to remove the mask clear just so that it is only the terrain that is coming in on this. The next is the mask or scatter points. Something interesting is while you could use any of the layers to scatter onto those for me were just purely used for uh, the purpose of scattering the materials or textures in this case. So I'm going to have my height field mask by feature be exposed for a couple of settings. And so that's going to be copied in. 
So now we have our mass by feature. And then it is about what prop we're going to scatter. So in this case, let's see a box. It's going to be a little small. So you're probably not going to see that on the environment. When we view our high field scatter, it's going to try and copy way too many points. So that is because it's by coverage. I'm going to set this by total point count, which is going to set to a limit of 1000. And you can see wherever the mask is. So currently the mask is in too far of a region. Let's set to just the sharp parts of the mountain so it's easier to see. See now we're copying our cubes, but it may work vice versa. Maybe it's the flat parts of the mountains and so on. So this is going to be something we expose into our system. So the first thing I'll want to expose in my HDA is going to be these min max slope angle. So let's create an HDA. I'm going to select the whole part of the tool, not including the height field. And again, we're going to go assets, new digital asset from selection. This is going to be EPC01. And this is going to be scatter. I'm just versioning with a one, by the way. There's no real reason other than that. If we go to our input and output part of the HDA, our input one label, this is going to be height field in. And I'm going to also go to the basic input and I'm going to change my maximum inputs to two and hit apply. So it's going to have two inputs and we're going to go to input output and our second input will be geo in. So that's going to be what we're copying within Unreal. Hit apply and I dive into my HDA. We can see there is a number two and that is geo in. If I connect that to my height field scatter, we're not copying anything. I'm going to just cut that box with control X and control V it back in. So now we have imagine any asset brought in from Unreal, in this case, our box. It is copied to our scatter points and instanced around the mesh. So we're going to go to the parameter section. So right here, and we're going to expose a couple of parameters to be ed edited within Unreal. So again, the first one that I said earlier was min and max. All you have to do is drag min max slope angle. You can change the label or the naming and engine. I'm happy with that for now. I'm also going to copy the smooth radius. I'm trying to think if there's anything else I might want. Probably fine with just those three on my mask by feature and I hit apply. And when we go up to our subnet, you can see those parameters are now exposed at the top of our tool. So I'm going to go back in and I'm going to right click where it says subnet two, click on parameters and channels and click on parameters. That will just have a pop up so we can see what are the parameters that our HDA will have exposed. So the first thing I want to do is with this height field scatter, I'm going to disconnect the what we're copying to it. Because for me, this is just going to be the point and we'll copy using that information afterwards. So we're going to use a copy to point. I'm going to turn on pack and instance. We're going to connect our geometry to copy to be our geo in. It's going to be on this side and our target points to copy to will be coming from that high field scatter directly. If I view it, you can see now we're copying boxes to those points. And then you'll see the output. You always want this connected at the end of whatever graph you want it to be. This will always render uh, in Unreal to be or whatever engine. This will be what's actually outputted. We're going to connect our copy to points to the output node. From here, this I mean, you could say this is done. One of the things I don't like about the current setup is it's aligning itself to uh, the terrain's normal. So I'm going to turn off match normals with terrain. Uh, one thing that I do like is it has a match direction with slope. We're going to try and do cliffs with that uh, in the second version of the scatter. So I'm going to drag that into our parameters, and that's just going to be a parameter we can choose. 
the randomized yaw. So that's going to be its rotation around its uh, up down uh, vector. And we can drag that over, hit apply. Again, if you check your parameters right here, you can see we have those parameters that are directly exposed. So when you edit them in the tool, it edits them within the graph. You could expose the seed. So again, let's drag that over. I'm going to have the total point count also be exposed and apply. And that's probably good enough for now. Something I might do is having an outer radius. I believe if I remember this off the top of my head, this is for collision, could be wrong. Um, so you could expose that as well, but for now we'll leave that off. And I think I'm happy with everything seen there. So let's bring this into Unreal and see if this works as our first version of scattering. So go back to Unreal. We go to our documents folder again, go to Houdini 19.5, OTLs, and then this is gonna be EPC01 scatter. I'm gonna drag that into my Houdini tools folder. Drag this into the world. Remember at every stage, please save so you don't lose your progress of the day. I'm gonna hit file, save all. That's going to have to reload the train. That's fine. We don't mind. Then in our EPC scatter, we scroll up and we find HF in. We're going to change it from geometry input to asset input. So that's going to allow us to reference another uh, Houdini digital asset. And so this is going to be referencing the height field. Let that load. And then our geometry input, I mean, this can be anything within Unreal. I'm going to go to, let's try and find a prop, something epic content, meshes, foliage. I'm going to take one of these cactuses. I'm going to drag this in. I'm going to tick on preferred nanite fallback mesh. It's going to cook for a moment. And when this is properly working, this big Houdini logo will disappear and your props should be within the landscape. There we go. It's scattered around the terrain. You can now see it within the world. If we edit any of those parameters that we exposed, again, you can see them at the top, our min max slope angle. So I'm going to decrease the min and set it to something like 10 degrees. So it's never placed on a steep surface. So now we have our cactuses that are always placed out throughout the terrain. Um, you know, again, you can randomize your yaw for something like this. So they all have random rotations. I'm going to turn off match direction slope. I don't care for a cactus if it's oriented with the slope angles. Again, we're working with uh, meant to be flat surfaces here. And I'm going to increase my point count to something like 3000. So now we have our large cactuses put through all out the map. The next thing I want to do is we're going to layer up the complexity of this. Maybe we want cliff meshes that are placed inset into the mountains. And so that's going to hide the kind of, if we zoom in, uh, the little bit of ugly stretching from the UVs here. So if we can place the cliff meshes that are in, I believe they're in the general folder. Could be wrong. I am wrong. Uh, let's find those real quickly. Northwood, epic content, I believe it's in mega scans, meshes, and then there's a bunch in here. If you drag them into the scene, you can see their scale. So we're going to try and find one that's relatively large. Massive, this is the one we're going to use. So there is an S massive sandstone cliff. If we look at it from the front, that's what the mesh that we're going to copy to those cliff faces will look like. And let's go back to our Houdini side 
and complete that part of the tool. So if we wanted to add cliff meshes, so these are going to be very large placed on the angled section. So this is going to be a pretty steep. So we can say 39 to 90 degrees. And if we view that mask, let's see if it lines up. If we increased our smooth radius, that's going to blur out some of those meshes. Just so we are masking out the large chunks. Again, if you placed it, for example, in this tiny alcove, uh, then it's maybe doesn't have enough space for multiple meshes there. For this step, I'm going to kind of branch off of my scatter. I'm going to have a switch. This switch is going to say, is this a cliff? And if it is a cliff, we're going to do a slightly different type of scattering. So this is going to be my end result. I'm going to drag that into the copy to points. From here, we can expose this. Instead of dragging and dropping in, I'm going to scroll down in my part your type, go to toggle, drag in toggle and say, is cliff question mark. Cliff, barn, doesn't matter what you name, and hit apply. Then in our pop out menu, that's over here, you can say we have a toggle that is, is cliff. I'm going to right click it and hit copy parameter. Go to my switch, right click, paste relative reference. With that inside, now when we click, it's going to switch. You can see there's a little error warning. That's because we only have one input. And I can go off to the side here. So in this case, if it's a cliff, it's going to go to the right. And if we view that switch, you can see it. So it's changing the dotted line to a solid line and just alternating that. Cool. So we're going to go off to the cliff side. For this, I want to place these cliffs only when the meshes have space for it. So from here, I'm going to convert it to a mesh. So I'm going to do a convert height field, connect that in, and I'm going to connect it in just after the mask wave feature. Now you see in its default state, we're converting it at a really high polygon rate. So I'm going to lower this density and you'll see that polygon number drastically drop. This probably can be set pretty low uh, as long as you're keeping roughly the same silhouette and same shape, then it should work. So I'm happy with, it's about 30,000 polygons right now. You could expose that part of the tool. I don't think it's necessary. And with here, I want to see if I can blast out the mask. So, so we converted our mask by feature to a mesh. From here, I put down a blast node and I did at mask lowercase m, which is what I had incorrect for, equals to zero. And I'm going to do delete non selected. So, pretty much anything that's masked in this uh, node right here, we're going to keep. Anything that's not masked is deleted. So, this is going to allow me to delete all these tiny meshes or sections that we don't need. Delete small, I always forget what it's called, delete small parts. It's a labs tool. You will need labs installed. I'm going to connect that in. Now, simply by connecting it, we just need to increase our scale of these thresholds to be large enough. So again, this is by eye. You can see the meshes slowly disappear as we get larger and larger. Because we're passing in a fairly large chunk, I'm going to say around 1400 uh, area size. So that's going to be, again, the area of these mountains that we're exposing. Just in case anything was fused, just double checking if that's changing any outcome. OK, it doesn't look like we need a fuse. And I'm going to use that to use my mask by object node. This is going to be my geometry to build our mask from. And we can copy that into 
a lower version. So this is going to be smoothed out a high field resample. I'll explain why I'm doing this in a second. So we've taken our mask, we've resampled it. I'm going to go lower resolution. So this is going to soften out again any of the terrain. It's going to make this operation a little quicker too because we're working with lower resolution terrain. Probably go quite small with this. There we go. So it's pretty blurred. We are masking in by our object. I've got increase this value, I believe. It doesn't seem to be changing our outcome. If I worked with the blur, it's going to soften it up. Again, probably not that necessary. But I'll add a blur just in case so it doesn't look too uniform. And I will pass this into my height field scatter node now. I'm not going to use the same height field scatter as before. I mean, you could, but in this case, because I wanted to automatically adapt. I don't want to say there's 200 and fit it over all the points. I just want it to figure itself out. I'm going to use a high field scatter. And I'm going to connect there to there. So again, because by default, this is going to be by a really strong density. So I'm going to use a by density using mask layer. You can see right now we don't have a mask connected. So all you have to do is pass that in there. So it's only copying to our mask. And if this is a cliff, you can see we have our density here. This can be scaled uh, within Unreal. And so I'm just going to drag and drop that into our parameters. Density if cliff. Hit apply. So at this stage, again, you kind of have to be careful um, because with density, depending on the size of your terrain, you could, if it's a small terrain, it could be very dense. So just be cognizant of what your max point is set to so you don't crash your Unreal. Uh, sometimes I'll set this number to 1000 just while I'm testing, just so I don't load in way too many meshes uh, without intending to. But I know with the current setup, uh, it's fine as default. And passing this into our switch. Now, as we copy to points, I'm going to turn off keep incoming terrain on both the height fields. I don't want the terrain coming from the uh, scatters. And I'm going to see what other options we have on this height field scatter. So effectively, the second version here is only copying. So it's a mask. I'm going to jump back a few minutes. Close my parameters. When you want to mask out for cliffs, for example, and we're using very large meshes, we want to ensure the cliffs are of a relatively large scale. So we're masking out only the ones above a certain threshold. From there, we're using that as our mask. And then with the height field scatter, the reason I wanted to keep this all within height fields and not just keeping it within mesh land is it has a match direction with slope. Um, in the height field scatter, whereas the scatter points or scatter in line doesn't have this. And it's crazy useful because for meshes that align, for example, the cliffside meshes, they want to line up in the direction of our mountain. This is essential. And this is exactly what we need. And I'm going to turn off match normals so it's not um, orienting it in weird directions. This might be enough uh, for the current state. So let's hit assets, edit asset properties. I'm going to hit apply and accept. And if we go back to Unreal, we go to our Houdini tools. You can now go to our GoProc or EPC. Sorry, this is the file for today. And you'll see its file name is referenced. Uh, it's about six uh, attributes down from the list. If you right click and you hit reimport, it's going to Grab it from your folder and automatically update. It will not update the instances within the scene. 
Uh, in order to do that, you have to hit rebuild. But for something new like cliff meshes, we don't have in the scene yet, I can drag it in. You'll see we now have is cliff. This will be a cliff in this case. I'm going to change my height field into asset input. And you'll see we have both our HDAs here now. We can put select height field. I'm going to scroll down. I'm going to turn on pack geometry before merging. Don't believe it's necessary, but I will have that turned on. I'm going to go to the mega scan folder meshes, and I'm going to find that mesh that I spoke about previously. This is S massive sandstorm cliff. Just drag it in, verifying. And I'll just undo that. In this case, instead of dragging that mesh into the geo in, I'm going to drag in this modular fence. You can drag in any mesh. You just want to ensure it's not too high poly. Otherwise, the transfer time can be insane going from Houdini back into Unreal. If you use a placeholder mesh, scatter the placeholder and then use the instancer replacement at the afterward, it's actually really efficient. So in this case, we are copying our fence high into the geo in, and I can drag that massive cliff into our mesh instancer. And straight away, you can see we have our cliff into engine. Now, there's a couple problems here. The main one being it's peaking over top the mountainside. So I'm going to add one last parameter into our system just so we have a nice smooth cliff that smoothly integrates into the system. We're going to go back to Houdini. I'm going to put a axis align node down, connect that into the Geo1, and we can just expose all three of these. I have a vision that I've already exposed. And we can go into our edit asset. We're just going to clear away those parameters there from a previous demo and drag in the justify X, justify Y, justify Z. Hit apply. There we go. I believe that should be working. I'm going to hit asset save EPC01. Go to Unreal. I right click. I'm going to re import. Just had to reload my Unreal. For some reason, that was glitching out. So I'm going to scroll down to my mesh instancer. We're going to select the cliff mesh. Sorry, uh, scroll up to our geo in. I'm going to tick prefer, prefer nanite fallback mesh. I'm going to drag in my massive sandstone. Now we have instanced it in the world. Final thing we have to do is justify it against max. You're going to see it is now being placed at the bottom of each point. One thing I'm going to do is push the center out. I believe it is the justify Z. So this is just something I experiment with. There we go. So all that was, was we were aligning where we copy our meshes to the points. So imagine if there is a point at the top, it's going to copy the uh, mesh downward on it. So it will always, it will never be above the top of these cliffs. If we look inside, they are being drawn inside of the mesh. Uh, there's a couple ways you can approach this. So if we just go to a steeper cliff, for example, the first thing you could do is on the mesh instancer, you could bring them out. Uh, so you could position them farther. So we could bring them up from the original spawn point, we could push them in or out of the original wall. Uh, you just have to be careful because the meshes you're copying are not that thick. So you will get gaps from it. But if this is a distant mesh, uh, that doesn't really matter. And then we can play with the density uh, to see how dense these cliffs are. So this is 0 0.01, 0 0.02. We start to get it filled out a little more. Uh, we can even lower the slope angle, go to 25. And that's going to really flush out our mountains. And I'm going to go back down to our inset, maybe even lower this a little bit. 100. 
So that's just going to blend it a little smoother, prevent the gaps being so common. Even we're setting to zero, I'm just going to do this by eye. That seems to be the limit, about 90. I tell them mesh is no longer in the wall. So from here, again, play with your instances, how many you have. So we're going with our density, increasing even further. I'm going to pull that farther out of the wall. There we go. Something I'm happy with. Now, if we go to all the other cliff sides, you'll see anywhere that's using a relatively steep angle as its mesh replaced, it's going to have pretty good normals. Um, and you can now populate this world to your heart's content. We don't have to use cactuses. I mean, you could, if we, instead of the Joshua tree, this could be a modular fence post. I'm just going to replace those same assets. It could be cut wood, a little tiny thing. Imagine if you had curve tools, so you could do rails. If you had buildings on set up. And it's all about just positioning these objects in the space. So something like this probably need to be set into the ground a little bit. Uh, minus 1.2, minus 5. Ooh, it's going to be quite a bit. This one to work smoothly. There you go. So now everywhere that this mesh is placed, it's smoothly blending into your terrain. You're not going to notice. Um, and yeah, and you can just populate your world with as many of these scatter as your performance allows uh, and play with the settings. And you can really push it. Imagine now, instead of basing off of a full random noise, you could use a Mapbox node, for example, I've talked about in previous talks. Uh, and you could load in any location in the world, specify that, blend that into your terrain. So now you're basing off of your landscapes, off of a real life map box location. Um, and I'll show a quick demo of that. So if we were back in Houdini, we would go back up to our, our road section. And this is the custom landscape that we created. If you loaded somewhere in the world from map box, for example, this is a valley somewhere in Rokinha, we can use the height filled layer. I'm going to switch it from replace to blend. And now you could expose your geo slider. So we can take fully the original Rokina. We can take wherever you want. I mean, you can play with these creating whole new noises, whole new locations. It's probably won't ever work stick with blend in this case. And then you can play with your scales. So you could say, imagine if this is a valley and we're taking that Roking Ha. Bring out the valley side. Now you could pass this back into Unreal, for example, and it would automatically set up all your layers. I mean, I could even do this right now. I'll drag that into our replace. Do assets, save, EPC, high field. I'm going to re-import my node right here. Go to my EPC high field. And I'm going to click rebuild. We'll just wait for this to complete. Took it a moment to load, but it loaded in our entire new terrain. I'm going to fly back up. Causing problems for our runtime virtual texture seems to be. This is probably because the bounds are not set to the same. There we go. If I reset the bounds. Now, when we scroll out in this world, we have our auto cliff tool. It's completely automatically updated. The density is set. Uh, it's probably even too high for this size of world. I'm going to lower that density back down. And it's going to regenerate how many glyphs it places within those meshes. And I think you can kind of see the power of Houdini here and like the iterative nature 
just because we've regenerated our new terrain, all our meshes, all our HAs are all connected, it will regenerate. Um, I mean, in this case, we have a few problem areas because our height field is not high enough resolution to support the steeper terrain, so we're getting these weird pulsing patterns. Um, but otherwise, it's effectively all working. We still have, you can see, our tombstones are being placed around the scene, our foliage is all being placed, it's all auto-texturing. We still have our cliff faces being auto-placed. Um, and you can really push these scenes to however far you want. So I hope you enjoyed today's tutorial. Um, hope you learned a couple of things and try and place a bunch of scatter, use this tutorial scene, and I'd love to see what your worlds look like. Thanks for all following along. Have a great day.